quiet really fast. So, uh, Welcome. Uh, I'm Ethan Burke from Primary Care uh, to one of our uh, intermittent yet more and more frequent Primary Care Grand Rounds series. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Leadership Preventive Medicine uh, Residency Program for co-sponsoring this with us. And they're providing Category 1 CME credit for this activity today. So if you are here taking this for uh, CME, be sure to sign in uh, in the back uh, before you go. If you're watching this in one of our uh, sites by VTEL, remember to complete the online survey with the link that you received uh, within one hour of the end of the presentation. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Uh, I'd like to just jump in and introduce Charlie here, and, and we'll get started. Charles Whelan is a senior lecturer and policy fellow at the Rockefeller Center at Dartmouth College. He joined the Dartmouth faculty in 2012, and he holds a PhD in public policy from the University of Chicago, a master's in public affairs from Princeton, and a BA from Dartmouth College. From 2004 to 2012, he was a senior lecturer in public policy at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. And prior to joining the faculty in Chicago, he was the director of policy and communications for Chicago Metropolis 2020, which is a business-backed civic group promoting healthy regional growth in the Chicago area. Prior to that, from 1997 to 2002, Charlie was the Midwest correspondent for The Economist magazine and he has written articles for the Chicago Tribune, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal, as well as other publications. His most recent book, Naked Statistics, Stripping the Dread from the Data, reached the New York Times bestseller list for hardback uh, nonfiction. I think you had a copy of it here in your hand somewhere. Oh, right there. So I'd like to go ahead and welcome Charlie. Remember, if you haven't uh, signed up for your CME credit, please do so. And if you are uh, at one of our sites in Nashua or Keene, Manchester, Concord, uh, Bennington, um, then uh, please be sure to take the Survey Monkey uh, at the end of the presentation so we can give you credit as well. Great, right, thanks. Well, thank you for having me. I see a lot of familiar faces from all the different aspects of my Hanover life, so that's a lot of fun. I will also say that I play in a Friday morning hockey league, and at my age, I always envisioned that I would be rushing from the rink to DHMC, but this is a much better way to get here, a much more civilized approach. So I'm going to talk a little bit about statistics, and probably more actually about the marriage of data and statistics. Statistics hasn't changed a whole lot. We're still using the same tools that we used when I was in grad school, with some refinements and so on. What has changed is the quantity of data available to analyze and the tools that we can use. And as you saw, the, the title of the speech was, was something along the lines of statistics, dynamite, and hair removal cream, things that you should use with great caution. I threw in the hair removal cream because as I was writing the book, I kept using military metaphor after military metaphor, grenades and nuclear weapons. And I realized I had to at least do something slightly different. But the idea is that statistics is it's, it's a neutral tool. It's something that you can do ill with, you can do great things with, and I want to reinforce in this talk how powerful it is, but like any truly powerful thing, if you point it slightly in the wrong direction or if it falls into the wrong hands, it can do enormous damage. And one of the things we were talking about before I came up here is that there's a, a fine line, actually, between something that is extremely helpful and then it drifts into a realm where it can make us quite uncomfortable. And actually, I'm only going to read a tiny, tiny bit. But I do want to start the discussion with a little section from the book, because I think this sets the stage for how powerful statistics have become. And this is the whole idea of predictive analytics, that if we give you enough information, you can draw some very powerful conclusions from it. So this is a story about Target, the retailer. And it says, let's drill down for a moment on one example, the kinds of things that the statisticians working in windowless basements can figure out. Target has learned that pregnancy is a particularly important time in terms of developing shopping patterns. Pregnant women develop what they at Target describe as, quote, retail relationships that can last for decades. As a result, Target wants to identify pregnant women, particularly those in their second trimester, and get them into their stores more often. A writer for the New York Times Magazine followed what is literally called the predictive analytics unit at Target as they sought to find and attract pregnant shoppers. Now, the first part is easy. Target has a baby shower registry in which pregnant women register for baby gifts in advance of their birth, and they usually actually say the due date. So that's clue number one. These women are already Target shoppers, and they've effectively told the store that they're pregnant. 
But here's the statistical twist, and this is where it gets very interesting. Target figured out that other women who demonstrate the same shopping patterns are probably pregnant too. For example, pregnant women often switch to unscented lotions. They begin to buy vitamin supplements. They start, start buying extra big bags of cotton balls. So I, I can't figure all this stuff out, but this is, this is what the data show. The target predictive analytics gurus identified 25 products that together made possible what they described as a pregnancy prediction score. The whole point of this analysis was to send pregnant women pregnancy-related coupons in hopes of hooking them as long-term target shoppers. How good was the model? The New York Times Magazine reported a story about a man from Minneapolis who walked into a Target store and demanded to see a manager. The man was irate because his high school daughter was being bombarded with pregnancy-related coupons from Target. Quote from the man, she's still in high school and you're sending her coupons for baby clothes and cribs? Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? This was Minneapolis. Everyone was very nice. So the store manager apologized profusely. He even went so far as to call several days later because he was feeling really bad and apologize again. Only this time, the man was less irate. It was his turn to be apologetic. Quote again from the man, it turns out there's been some activities in my house I haven't been completely aware of. <laughs> She's due in August. So the target statisticians had figured out that his daughter was pregnant before he did. This is just a tool. It's the same, it's a variation on the tool that Netflix uses to figure out what movies you're going to like. It is something in a health field that we could use to figure out who's likely to get type 2 diabetes. It can be very powerful in the right hands. It can help us intervene in places that will make society better off. There was a story this morning on public radio talking about a predictive index for recidivism. Who's likely to show up back in jail again, which is Good on the one hand, if you can intervene in a way that you lower the chance of recidivism. It's quite dangerous if you start making social justice decisions on a prediction that may or may not be 100% accurate. So that is the essence of what I want to talk about today. So now I will, I will also say that, you know, with all due respect to Mr. Geisel, if I'd only paid a little more attention, clearly the medical school would be named after me and I'd be coming in on my helicopter because at many junctures, I've been so close to getting so rich as a result of this data revolution. So I'll tell you the first one. About 22 years ago, a friend of mine, Dartmouth grad actually, called and he invited me out to a Mexican restaurant and he said, I got a business idea. I said, okay. He said, you know, right now physicians write their notes after they meet with a patient. They give them to an assistant. Uh, at the end of the day, the whole next day is consumed by the assistant typing up the notes. So the doctor gets them at least 24 hours later. I said, okay. And he said, what we could do is we could digitize the information. And I said, OK, well, I don't know what that is, but we could do that, OK. And he said, we could send it at the end of the day to India, because it's just 12 hours off. And you could pay someone to type it up there, and they would send it back, and it would be there the next morning. Because you've got all this fiber optic cable, it makes it quite cheap. My only question was, how many margaritas have you had? Because this just sounded like statistics meets science fiction. He went on to found Hotwire. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am, which is great. But, uh, uh, you know, it's this, this kind of looking ahead. And I think the first lesson is big data is here. And, you know, you probably read about big data. But the best way to conceive of what we can do and why we have so much information is to think back just 15 or 20 years ago when you walked into a store and there was a printed price tag on what you bought and somebody tore that off and then you gave them your credit card and they ran it through the imprint machine and they took a bunch of paper copies and dropped them in different boxes. If you then got arrested, somebody would type up your arrest report in triplicate and they would take the different carbon copies, put them in different boxes, they would disappear into a basement forever and no one would see them again. Well, all that has been replaced by a world in which someone scans your frequent value card. That's what they were doing at Target. That's how they're connecting who's buying what. They are then aggregating the data at the corporate level or perhaps beyond. It's married to other sources of data, everything from the census to your credit card records or so on. It's now searchable really around the world with the internet, and it's all digital. So you can play around with it in all kinds of ways that you wouldn't have been able to do before. That's all happened in a relative, relatively short period of time. So that's just what's going to happen. Now, statistics are the tools that we use for making sense of those data. 
And the tools are powerful in the sense that they give us some handle around which we can handle massive quantities of information. But in the process of doing this, and this is probably one of the big takeaways, statistics inherently simplify. That's what they do. So if I give you data on household income for 100 million Americans, there's nothing you could do with it. It would overwhelm you, just the size of the spreadsheet. Or size of, you could just scroll through it with a bunch of numbers, and you would have no mental traction. But as soon as you start to take the mean and the median and the standard deviation and changes over time, you put some form around the data in a way that helps to make sense. But as soon as you do that, then you are also leaving things out. You're inherently simplifying. So there's this obsession with lying with statistics. And of course, people can lie with statistics, but they can lie without statistics. It's actually much easier. And people who are inherently dishonest are inherently dishonest. The more subtle issue, and the one you should pay more attention to, is that statistics inherently have a point of view. And often people using statistics have a point of view. So the best analogy I like is that stati statistical analysis is like a courtroom. And by law in this country, both the prosecution and the defense have access to all of the same information around a case. All of the interviews, all of the evidence, all the forensic evidence, and so on. But when you show up in the courtroom for the trial, the prosecution and the defense are going to present very different interpretations of that evidence. They're each going to simplify. They're each going to leave things out. They're each going to emphasize some things more heavily than others. And essentially, that's what you can do with statistics. You can look at that data on 100 million households, and you can pull out certain kinds of things that emphasize or de-emphasize whatever point you're trying to make. So I'll give you a perfect example. So how many of you remember we had the, big, the, the tax cut during the Bush administration? And the administration accurately said that the average tax cut for an American household would be about $1,000. OK, anyone want to tell me, you know, that's, if you're in a courtroom, why you might choose the average tax cut? How many of you think that most people actually got $1,000? Why is the average such a misleading figure in that case? What happens if I get a $100 million tax cut, right? Then the rest of yours is going to be very small, and the average is going to be very big, right? If you got 10 people on a bar stool, and they all make $35,000, Bill Gates sits down on the 11th bar stool. The average income in that bar goes up to about $100 million. Nobody's gotten any richer. You just have an outlier. And means are very prone to outliers. So you want, if you got a tax cut that is skewed towards very big tax cuts for people who make a lot of money, you want to use the average. Turns out that something on the order of 80 or 90% of the households got a, a tax cut that was about, the median tax cut was something like $93. Right? So that's one where you, they're both accurate, but you can take your own spin on it. So that's what I, I want you to remember. Now, the last is that you, there's a little participation here. One of the other things that's really important to remember about statistics is the evidence is always circumstantial in the case that almost never can we prove using numbers alone that something has happened, something makes you better, or that somebody has committed a crime. Instead, what we do is we present a scenario in which Something unusual happens. The people taking the green pill get much better. And that might happen by chance, but it's highly unlikely. And as a result, we're going to infer that it probably wasn't chance, and instead the green pill was more effective than the yellow pill. Now, let's talk about the limitation of that approach. So I want everybody to take out a coin if you got one. I know we're in a kind of a coinless society. And uh, whoever does really well in this will be, you know, the people who do really well will be some of the recipients of the free book. So there's actually an incentive here. So take out a coin. If you don't have a coin, you can flip an idea. It's just got to have heads and tails. It's a very simple exercise. And what we're going to do is we're going to flip, and everybody who flips heads stays in. If you flip tails, you're out. All right, you guys ready? All right, so flip number one. All right, I'm still in. If you raise your hand if you got heads because you guys are still in. The tails, your chances of a free book just disappeared. <laughs> it, won't, it won't change your life. All right, round two. All right, I'm out, but I have a book. All right, so who's still got two heads in a row? All right, keep going here, folks. All right, round three. I'm flipping. I don't know why I'm flipping. So more heads. All right, so who's still got heads? One, two, three, four. All right. 
Uh, let's do one more. <laughs> Round four. All right, another heads. Who's still in it? One more. Two more. All right, one more. Let's go. Round five. All right, five heads. Anyone else with five heads? Five heads here, five heads here. Okay, five heads here. So we have a five or six. Remember that, you guys, are, you, you'll be the recipients of free books. Now, more important, the chances of flipping five heads in a row are about three in 100. But so not inconsistent with what we got in this room. The standard bar for statistical significance in an academic paper is a 5% significance level. So essentially, if the chances of observing whatever happens purely as a matter of chance are below 5 in 100, then we assume that something else is at play. Right? So if people eating a lot of broccoli have lower rates of colon cancer and there's a control group, and we see such a dif difference between the experimental group and the control group that it's unlikely that these folks just got lucky with regard to colon cancer, we will say if the, the odds of this difference between the two groups is less than 5 in 100, we're going to assume something else is going to go on. We're going we're to rule out that this is strictly a matter of chance. And although we cannot prove that the broccoli is preventing colon cancer, that will then become the working assumption. Now, why do I say that? Because if you do enough studies, looking at enough things, and big data allows you to do that, then you're going to find some things that just happen by chance. Right? So if, this, if, we were, if I were editing a journal, so let's have our coin flippers raise their hands again. Right? At this point, you know, this is not exactly a perfect example, but not bad, we would rule out the possibility, or we could, that this happens strictly by chance. So what, I mean, is it in the elbow? Is it you know, the wrist? Is it because you're wearing a blue shirt? Is it the glasses? Right? What is it that makes you such a good coin flipper? <laughs> and the answer is nothing, except that we had lots and lots of people flipping coins. And the problem, or the challenge, I should say, with lots and lots of people looking at lots and lots of data is we're going to see associations. And these associations may be very, very important patterns. Right? So in the beginning, we started to see associations between smoking and lung cancer, smoking and heart disease, and they just showed up as anomalous patterns. And the cigarette companies, to their discredit, said, no, it's not really causal. Other things may be going. It took a long time to establish that relationship. But if we look at enough data, we might also see connections between lung cancer and purple shoes, between lung cancer and watching television. And those things, you know, if they're not corroborated, are going to look a lot like your coin flipping, which is you got enough people looking at enough data, you're just going to see some spurious results. And that is, if not dangerous, at least potentially irresponsible. So I want you to kind of remember that coin flipping exercise. All right. So some general, there are about six general lessons I want you to take away from today, and then we'll have some questions. The first one is that good data matter. So this isn't just about predicting who's pregnant. There, our quality of life can be dramatically enhanced if we actively collect the data that inform decisions that matter. And this is not, this is a, a photo of a Ford Explorer that rolled over. Many of you are aware of that connection that was established between the Firestone tires and the Ford Explorer rolling over. How many of you know how we found that pattern? Right, so the good news is there weren't actually that many fatalities relative to huge epidemics and so on, right? Several hundred. And it's also likely that most of them never showed up at the same ER. So how, when you've got something like that that's spread out over an entire country, and the accidents are all disparate, how is it that you find that pattern? All right, well, the answer is we have a very rigorous, as many of you may know, in the ER, we require a lot of information by federal law any time anybody dies in a motor vehicle accident. There's a system, I believe it's called the FAR system. So uh, I can't remember the acronym, but Fatal Auto Recording System or something like that. What it means, and this is the important takeaway, is that when somebody dies in a car accident, local law enforcement and related agencies are required to record what the blood alcohol level, what kind of car was it, what, how old were the, the driver and the passengers, what was going on, what were the weather conditions, uh, the, you know, what was the nature, uh, so you then pull in the medical records, so what was the nature of the fatal industry, I, injury? And as a result of that, 
we found the connection between the Ford Explorer and the tires, as we found many of the other breakthroughs in auto safety. So it was early on that we realized people were having their chests crushed by the steering wheel, and then we went, then went to collapsible steering wheels. That was when we realized that airbags are highly effective at preventing fatalities, and those kinds of things. Seat belts obviously work, but it was a, it was a federal decision to collect disparate pieces of data and to then to look for patterns that suggest ways we can make driving cars and other kinds of things safety. Now, why do I say versus guns? We do not do the same thing for guns, but there was one experiment to try and parallel what we do around auto fatalities. The state of Wisconsin got a grant from the Joyce Foundation, and they worked with one of the medical schools in Wisconsin to simulate at the state level the fatality reporting system around automobiles, only they did it for gun deaths. And they basically required that anytime anybody dies by gun, so it's suicide, injury, or suicide, accident, homicide, that they would take all the data that exists now but are never brought together in one form. So you'd go to the coroner and learn more about the nature of the death itself. You'd find out where the gun came from, what kind of gun was it, what was the nature of the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim, all these kinds of things. And then they would look for patterns. How frequently when somebody commits suicide is the gun purchased within a week? Uh, when gun accidents happen, what kind of guns are most prone to accident? When the city of Milwaukee did a gun buyback program, are the guns that they are buying back the ones that are most likely to be involved in fatal, fatal gun accidents, and so on. It was extremely interesting, but it has never been scaled up to the national level, in large part because there is a lot of resistance often to providing information that may point fingers, may be uncomfortable for certain parties. The other reason is that it is massively expensive. The gift of data does not come cheaply. So how many of you have heard of the National Children's Study? So this is just underway. It's going to follow America, I think it's 100,000 children from before birth, which means that, that it begins with interviews with pregnant women. Right, so relate, you know, all the things around the nature of their pregnancy, potential environmental contaminants in the home while they're pregnant, all the way through age 21. Longitudinal study, follow the same kids. And of course, what does that allow you to do? Well, it allows you to look at things like autism and drug use and dropping out of schools. I mean, think of all the social issues around early childhood health, around early child behavior, around the relationship between the home environment and school outcomes. I mean, this is an enormous treasure trove of potential data. And when you think, I mean, for those of you who are epidemiologists, when you think about something like autism, where we're still groping for the relationships that really matter, this much data is a huge gift, particularly when you're looking at a wide range of environmental, biological, and other considerations. Anyone want to guess roughly how much that's going to cost? Oh, $80 million. That would be so quaint. <laughs> Second guess, based on my response to $80 million, it's got a B in it, not a T. There are no trillion. Uh, $6 billion with a B, right? Because you're following, one of the things that you have to do is you have to follow the same kids for 21 years. It's extremely expensive to stick with the same folks, and yet that's what's so valuable. For those of you who are familiar with the Framingham study, where we've gotten so much of the information around heart disease and other factors related to that, it has been these cohorts, and now they're into multi-generational cohorts. So you follow people for 40, 50 years, their behaviors, now you're looking at their kids, the genetic contributions across generations. These things are not cheap, but they are enormously valuable. And it's hard, if not impossible, for anybody other than government uh, or government funding nonprofits to gather that kind of research. All right. Number two, precision and accuracy are not synonymous. Data and statistics allow us to be very precise. Right? We can do medical tests, we can do other kinds of things, and the answer is going to be 3.271. The difference is that things can be precise and totally wrong. So if we walk out to Route 120 and someone says, well, which way is Lebanon? And I say, it's, oh, it's about 3.41 miles that direction. And I point towards Lyme. That is a very precise answer, and the person is driving in the wrong direction. However, when so, if you ask somebody and they say, oh, Lebanon, 3.21 miles, you kind of think they know what they're talking about. right? So there is a danger 
in that precision suggests, hey, if I instead say, well, just kind of drive that way and you'll see a gas station and a little green, right? That's a very imprecise answer, but if I'm pointing the right direction, that's the answer you want. So I'll give you one serious and one trivial example. We'll start with a sad, so Tommy Green, one of my golf buddies is here. You were probably present for this. My wife gave me a Ray golf range finder for my birthday, which is the one where you stand in the fairway, you point it at the pin, and it tells you exactly how far you are from the pin. So 152.6, none of this kind of looking at the 150 yard marker and paging it. I know exactly how far I am. And my golf game just got worse and worse. I'm firing into the woods. I hit into that municipal parking lot behind the fire department for Hanover. So all the police cars, personal, you know, the, all the personal cars in the back, my balls bouncing around there. It was a disaster. I finally read the instruction manual and the thing had been set to meters the whole time, not yards. <laughs> so I'm getting this very precise answer that's completely wrong. All right, now the more serious and unfortunate example, uh, the value at risk model. This is what essentially blew up Wall Street and probably contributed more than anything else to the onset of the financial crisis. Value at risk is this concept in a set of highly sophisticated statistical models built around the idea that financial firms could look across their entire portfolio and for each asset, they could assign a specific risk over a period of time. So over the next week, and they had a probability associated with it. So over the next week, 99 times out of 100, the maximum loss exposure associated with this asset is $800,000. You can then take all of the assets and you can aggregate the risk and you can say over the next week, 99 times out of 100, the maximum loss for the firm, the value at risk, is going to be $131.2 million. And that allows you to have what feels like a very good sense of what the real risk of the firm is. The problem is that the models looked a lot like me pointing the wrong direction and offering you a very precise answer because the models were terrible. In particular, the models assumed that real estate prices would never fall significantly. Right, so if you build into your risk models that real estate prices won't fall and you've got a whole bunch of assets that are backed by real estate, and you're making decisions with a false sense of security, then you're actually gonna do things that are more reckless than you would in the absence of the model. One way to think about this is that a broken speedometer is worse than no speedometer at all. If you have no speedometer at all, you have no choice but to look around and pay attention. How fast are the other cars going? Does this feel like I'm driving the appropriate speed? You look at the context and you make common sense decisions. If you get a broken speedometer that says, hey, I'm only going 28 miles an hour, then you're just gonna stare at the speedometer. You may be going 71. You're gonna no longer pay attention to context. There was, unfortunately, this, this happened too late for the book because it's a great little story. There was a woman who drove 900 miles out of her way in Europe because she was following her GPS device. Right? She just like went to the grocery store and just kept driving like through Poland and, and at one point she slept on the side of the road. I mean there may have been other things going on. But <laughs> clearly this person was not paying attention. And indeed many of them, I've got a GPS device. You know you stop looking at the map, you stop getting directions ahead of time and you put a lot of faith into what the model and the data are telling you and that can be very dangerous. So one of the takeaways is common sense matters, it will always matter, it doesn't matter how fancy the models are, and if anything, the fancy models can lead us down a dangerous path. All right, predictive analysis, you saw this a little bit with the target example, right? That basically, you know, are you pregnant, are you not pregnant? If you're a Netflix customer, Netflix actually did something interesting, which is they offered a million dollars to anybody who could improve on their model for figuring out what movies you're gonna like by 10% or more. And they measure that by saying, if they recommend a movie for you and they think you're gonna give it four stars, you actually rate it something. So they have a quantitative measure of how right they were. And they said to folks, anybody, anybody around the world, teams could register. If you can predict what these folks are gonna rate these movies and your predictions improve on our predictions by 10%, you get the million dollars. And this is just a variation on what Target was doing, which is you rate movies, other people rate movies. We can look for a pattern 
whereby, boy, these folks all seem to like the same kind of movies you do. And here are five movies that they've seen and you haven't. And they gave them an average of 4.8. So since you look like them in terms of taste, we think you're going to give it a 4.8. It's a variation on correlation, except that the model that came in was much, much more sophisticated than that. How long ago did you rate the movie? They rated you know, that your tastes are going to evolve. So if you rated it more recently, they rated it more strongly, and so on. And they did a very clever th thing in terms of evaluating the models, which is they gave the participants a huge quantity of data on movies that had been watched and rated, rated, and then they withheld a huge quantity of data. So they played around with your tastes and recommendations, and then they said, OK, how do you think they're going to feel about Shawshank Redemption? And they could match it against what they already knew you'd rated it. So there was a quantitative method. Somebody did, in fact, improve by 10%. They won the million dollars. All right, so this is all really good in the sense that when you come home and you don't want to watch a really bad movie, they've thought through what you're going to like. You do this on iTunes, everywhere else. It's actually probably pretty good that Target wants to know what you want to buy so that when you go to a local store, it's going to be there. I mean, even the pregnancy thing, you know, if you really want to buy pregnancy-related things, you're still getting the coupons. Uh, but let's take it one step farther. Anyone remember what movie this is from? Tom Cruise? Minority Report. What's the central premise of Minority Report? Predictive crime. Let's arrest people before they commit their crimes. There is a certain efficiency to it, right? OK, there's an example in the book. We, the San Jose Police Department claims they have now done this. This is how they did it, right? The good news is that predicting patterns of crime is actually very important, right? If you, if you figure, if you look at something like CompStat, where crimes are likely to happen, and you know that from three to five on weekdays on this corner, you got a lot of violent activity, then parking three more police cars there is exactly what we want to be doing. We want to be channeling our resources in a way that makes best possible use of them. Here's what happened in San Jose. They had a hot spot. They had a parking garage where there were frequent break-ins, and they were happening with regularity at a particular time. So they sent some police officers to the parking garage. There were two women loitering around the cars. They asked some questions of the women, and it turns out that both of them were wanted for other crimes. So one of them had an outstanding warrant. So they were able to arrest them for other things. But their supposition is, we effectively have arrested them for the crimes they were about to commit, which is breaking into these cars. All right, so think about how that can possibly go wrong, right? So let's just think, if we were here at a hospital, let's think about health care. The good, news, right? the good news is maybe we can look at people and say, you know what? You are at great risk of type 2 diabetes. You are, based on, at a relatively young age, we think that you're going to have heart disease. You've got all the predictive factors, maybe even for child abuse, things like that. We want to intervene. Medicine is moving in a direction where prevention is more important than ever before. If we can change the trajectory of somebody's health outcome, that is all good. But the same information in the hands of an insurance company or even an ACO or something else like that where they don't necessarily want to make you better. Maybe they do. But they certainly don't want to pay for you if they think you're going to be really expensive. That can be a particularly dangerous tool. So this, like so much else, is one of those things that kind of cuts both directions. It's about who gets access to the information. Genetic testing being a perfect example. So I'm from Chicago originally. There was an example. Eddie Curry was a player for the Bulls. He was due for a contract extension. It was about a $40 million extension. They said, we'll do it. Just one more thing. We need to do a genetic test. There was concern that he had an enlarged heart and that his health was at risk. Now, the Bulls said they, it was all about his health. You might also infer it was a lot. It was about the $40 million. But in any event, they said, we're not signing the contract unless you do the test. And in the end, they never reconciled on that. He was traded to the Knicks. And what we don't know is whether he had taken the test privately and had more information than the Bulls. But we're at a place where we can't perfectly predict who's going to get sick. But we're a lot better at it than we used to be. And that's good from the standpoint of delivering health care. But it's also a little dangerous in terms of some of the larger sociological questions. And that's kind of one of the themes, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's immigration, uh, or other things like that. I mean, it, you only have to go half tick from very powerful predictive analytics in policing before you're right at the door of racial or ethnic profiling. Right? Your model may be very good, but you know, God forbid that somebody look like 
the perfect perpetrator who happens to drive across the Canadian border at the right time or the wrong time, and you got yourself a real mess. All right. We like lots of data, but when you have lots of data, you amplify the chance that you make mistakes. So one of the things that's easier to get data, it's also easier to get really bad data, right? So if I want to study something, in the old days, I'd have to go out and collect information on households. The census goes door to door. Now I can simply say, hey, I can go online and say, you know, send me your opinion on how you think Barack Obama's doing, in which case I'll get a perfect sample of people who have taken the time to reply and feel very strongly about the Obama administration, which will tell me an awful lot about bored young people on the internet. Right? It will be perfectly representative of nothing. Uh, and in fact, if you watch the, all of the debates around the Nate Silver stuff and the presidency, we had Frank uh, Newport, who is the chief, chief editor-in-chief of Gallup, come up to Dartmouth a couple summers ago. And he said, polling is one of the things that's actually getting harder. It's easy to get information. It is harder to get good information. And if you think about it, the sweet spot was about 15 years ago where everybody had a telephone for the most part. So you'd lost the bias that came from the fact that low-income people traditionally were less likely to have a phone. That could mess up your sample. And now we reach a point where people have caller ID. Cell phones mess things up enormously. It used to be the easiest way to do a phone sample is you take samples of area codes that are represented in the country. You dial a certain number in each area code in proportion to their share of the population. But now, someone with a 609 area code could be living in Washington or New Hampshire because their cell phone goes with them. Some people have a landline and a cell phone. So what Newport said is it's actually getting harder and harder to do decent telephone surveys, but it's getting easier and easier to do really lousy surveys. You can set up an auto dialer to just keep dialing numbers until people answer. That's not the way you do an appropriate poll. An appropriate poll picks 15 of you folks, and we are going to call you over and over until we get you. So we'll call you in the morning, we will call you at night, and so on. And then we will guarantee you if that sample is randomly chosen and we actually track you down, that we have a true random sample. If you do it the cheap and easy way, which is if you don't answer, I'll just call the next person, what you're going to get is a terrific sample of unemployed people who are home during the day without caller ID, right? Because those are the folks who are going to answer the calls if you just start calling household after household. So you have to be more cautious than ever about how easily big data can be collected and what the erroneous conclusions might be when you do analysis on that lousy sample. So that is in addition to all the traditional biases and pitfalls that surround data. One of the examples from the book that I found absolutely fascinating was a health-related example. It was a study of diet and breast cancer among women. And they had two groups. They had a group of women who had been diagnosed, diagnosed with breast cancer and a group that had not. They then asked the women about their diet retroactively. So over the last 20 years, tell us about how often you ate this, how often you ate that, and so on. And then we'll take a look at that and see how it correlates with your health outcome here. Are there discernible differences in the diet between the two groups? The twist was that it was not actually a study of diet. It was a study of how women who've been diagnosed with an illness recall their diet because either unbeknownst to the women or they'd forgotten, the researchers had collected information on their diet much, much earlier. And what they were doing is matching their recollection to what they had reported in real time on what they ate. What they found was that the women who had been diagnosed with breast cancer remembered their diet as being much worse than it actually was. And the supposition is that you're looking for some causality and you kind of impute backwards, boy, I must have been irresponsible what I was eating. So it turns out the recall bias is simply when you, for any number of reasons, you may recall incorrectly what's actually going on. That's just one of many, many different kinds of biases that can affect even decent data. Coincidences happen all the time. That's why I had you do the coin flipping exercise, which is if these were studies and we're trying to figure out which drug is preventive of a certain illness, you know, you five would have passed with flying colors, right? You know, five heads in a row, boy, clearly there must be something about what you're doing that is worth study, uh, which is why you always, you know, one of the great quotes from an epidemiologist is never think very hard about one study at all. When you start to see the results replicated, when it's corroborated by a biological or other evidence, then you might want to start paying attention. That's not necessarily the maxim that journalists pick up when they suddenly report that, boy, wearing a black shirt and glasses is really good for flipping heads. 
because that makes for a better story. And in fact, I brought one headline. This was admittedly tongue in cheek. Um, this is from the Wall Street Journal, the Dow of Tiger Woods. And apparently, whenever Tiger is playing well, the stock market goes up. Right? So if you're bullish on him at Augusta, now's the time to buy. Right? Or maybe it's just a coincidence. Uh, but a lot of, some coincidences are more credible than that, like perhaps immunizations and autism. I mean, think about the public price that we've paid there, where things just happen to, have, happen to go on at the same time, and people infer causality where it doesn't exist. Uh, and this is you know, one of the things that, that, that I reference in the book. There's a study, I think it was actually in the Journal of the American Medical Association, but it was John Ioannidis, if I'm saying it right, who looked at roughly 50 journal articles that had been published in the major medical journals and had been cited at least 1,000 times. And of those, roughly a third had been refuted by subsequent work for all kinds of reasons, either because technology changes, because the data were poorly drawn, because there was some bias by the researchers, but there are a lot of reasons that even very good studies can go wrong. All right, and, but then, so here's the mind-bending twist. So his research was published in a medical journal, which means that if he's actually right about his conclusion, then there's a pretty good chance that his research is wrong and will be refuted. So just think about that a lot, uh, and then your head will blow up. Uh, all right, so in that vein, one of our great challenge is going to be establishing causality. Um, there, there are too many examples here to talk about in great detail, but one study that just came up the other day is there is a strong connection between obesity and billboard advertising in certain neighborhoods. So you've got neighborhoods where you have billboards advertising unhealthy foods. You're more likely to have obese families and kids. That is related to the idea um, of food deserts, where in places where people are obese, you tend to have fewer supermarkets. But the real question here is whether you happen to have a population prone to unhealthy behavior, and that's why advertisers come in, or whether the advertising is promoting the unhealthy behavior, or perhaps both. So in social science, where most of the time we cannot do randomized experiments, it's very difficult, but arguably the most important thing, to isolate causality, whether something is actually causing an outcome that we care about. Uh, and there are some clever tools. So I'll, I'll skip over Esther Duflo, but um, there's some clever tools from outside of medicine that I think might be embraced by medicine that have been used because it's so hard in the social sciences to do controlled experiments. So one is natural experiments. So in situations where we cannot do a laboratory experiment, can we find situations that approximate one? So for example, we care a lot about whether increased police officers reduce crime. If you look at a simple correlation, what you're going to find is the places with the most police have the most crime. But of course, that's not causal. That's like the, apparently there's a Chinese emperor that wanted all the doctors killed because wherever the doctors went, people were dying a lot, right? Uh, he didn't really have the causality thing down, right? Uh, so there's a very clever experiment by two researchers who looked at the terrorism alert level in Washington, D.C. And when, terror, when the terrorism alert level hits orange, a whole bunch of police officers go out onto the street in D.C. because it's a terrorism target. Well, that's unrelated, we believe, to trends in street crime. So on days when it hits orange, do we have less street crime? And the answer is we do. Right? So what you find is a very clever way of trying to isolate the effect of police officers. And there are a lot of lessons like that. A lot of the great researchers aren't better at crunching numbers than everybody else. They're better at finding situations like that where there are clever methods for teasing out causality. Discontinuity analysis is another one. So in Chicago, there's a real example. We wanted to know whether sending kids who were struggling to summer school makes it more likely that they'll graduate from high school. Well, the kids who are doing real, really well don't have to go to summer school. So you don't want to be comparing the kids who go to summer school to the kids who don't, because it's going to look like summer school is actually making them worse. But of course, being a bad student is what gets you into summer school. Right? So what do you do? Well, summer school was mandatory. And there's a cutoff. What you can do is say, all right, well, if your grade point average or scores were a 59 or lower, you had to go to summer school. But there's a big group of people who scored 60. Right? They're just as bad as the 59s, but they skated over the line. And so what the research did is, let's look at the 59s versus the 60s, because they're essentially identical. And that turned out, I believe, that's, that uh, summer school did matter. 
A different study looked at the highly prestigious magnet schools in Chicago, which also have a cutoff to get in. And they said, you know, it's very quantifiable. What happens to the kids who just get in relative to the kids who just don't get in? And that effect appeared to be negligible, right? There was, you know, people are killing to get into these schools, and it turns out that just getting in doesn't seem to have much impact on the trajectory of your future life. All right, so let me finish with the last one, the last uh, that's going to be affecting us in every field. How many of you know who this woman is? Okay, who is she? All right, so this is when she got the award for the high test scores in Atlanta. She was also photographed uh, the last couple days. What was the more recent photograph? That was her, her mug shot, right? That was when they had this massive cheating scandal in Atlanta. Two conflicting takeaways from that. One is, well, as you, I'll go straight to the slide, this is the trade-off we're going to manage, right? So the existence of data means it's possible to manage by data. Performance objectives, we can measure your performance, we can pay you more for doing well, we can pay you less for doing less well, we can do it in health, we think we can do it in education, we can do other things. You know, you can't manage what you can't measure. Here's the flip side, Campbell's Law, the more important a statistic is for decision making, the more prone it is to manipulation and abuse, like Atlanta. Now, the good news is they were caught in Atlanta because of statistics. There are algorithms and even private sector companies that now look at answer sheets and they detect patterns that suggest cheating. What would be one pattern that suggests cheating? Erasures, but not just erasures, it's erasures from wrong to right, right? I mean, most, there are more wrong answers than right, so typically erasures should be even from wrong to right or right to wrong, or probably even more prone to go from right to wrong. Uh, if you've got massive erasers going from wrong to right, that's a, a yellow flag. If you've got kids missing easy questions and getting hard questions right, that's a red flag. Uh, there are other things like that, so you can run this through. And the people analyzing the Atlanta results found that the patterns they observed were so unlikely that if it were by chance alone, it would be roughly equivalent to filling whatever the, like the Georgia Dome, entirely with people who were seven feet tall or taller just by coincidence, right? That for some particular game, everybody was over, so virtually impossible. Now, you still can't prosecute people based on that pattern, but you can start looking around, and what they found was they were having things like pizza parties, where on the weekends, everybody would bring their answer sheets to somebody's home, they'd order pizza, have drinks, and they would sit around in a race, right, and, and move from wrong to right. So that, yeah, that just came down, they've all been, or 32 of them have been arrested. So the lesson here, is you gotta be very, very careful that you've got the data right, that you're truly measuring performance, uh, that people can't navigate in a way that you're gonna, gonna make you worse off. I'll actually finish with two examples here. One is just a very simple example from New York where the state decided that they would promulgate information on fatality rates for cardiologists for a specific procedure. I can't remember what the procedure was. All they were gonna do was publish it. Right, so there, was, there were no incentives attached, it was, there, was no, there were no punitive measures, it was just thought to be a benefit for consumers. Anybody know what happened? Right, if you're a cardiologist and you want to make your fatality rate better, one thing you can do is wake up and say, you know what, today, yesterday I really didn't care about killing people, but today I'm going you know, to focus on, you know, that doesn't happen, right? Everybody goes in. Yeah, you stop taking your sicker patients, right? So they, they went back afterwards, I think it was the New York Times or somebody, and interviewed cardiologists in New York, and something on the order, over 70% said that, that the, the fact that the data would be published had affected their decisions around the patients that they would take and the procedures that they would do. And of course, the, the paradox there is the people who are sickest are then least likely to get the care they might need. The education example, of course, we're always trying to figure out who the good teachers are, what the best schools are. And like medicine, we know there are bad schools and there are bad teachers. And we know that the status quo isn't particularly good in terms of paying everybody the same. So West, there's a study at West Point. West Point and all the military academies are great places to study education because the cadets are assigned randomly to courses. The syllabi are the same across all those courses and they all take the same tests. So you can't complain that bad students have selected in. And we can then say who the good professors are. Well, somebody looked at the data, and they found that the worst professors were the ones who'd been around a long time and had the most prestigious degrees. And the ones who were really knocking it out of the park based on exam scores and student evaluations were the young professors without serious credentials. 
All right, there's your answer, right? Get rid of the old codgers, make them retire gracefully. Except that someone said, huh, let's do a little more analysis and let's look at follow on courses. Let's see how both these groups do in their advanced engineering courses. And it turns out it flips. The folks who had the most experienced, most highly credentialed professors did better in their follow on work. Why? The supposition is that the young professors teach to the test, right? Which makes students very happy, which prompts nice returns in the short run, while the old codgers are thinking more about what you need to know in the long run, right? So it shows up. Here's the concept you need to know. They don't care as much about tomorrow's test, right? So if you just had stopped the analysis at the first point, your conclusion would have been dead wrong. So that's one where, and I'll stop with that, because to me, you need to be doing the analysis. It matters that you pay good teachers more, just like you want to reward effective medical institutions and so on. But you can get it dead wrong relatively easily, even with pretty good intentions. So that, you know, back to our dynamite statistics and hair cream example, um, there, there is a danger here. So I'll stop and uh, we'll take a few questions and then I'll sign some books for our, math, our coin flippers and uh, probably for people who ask questions too. You, that'll you know, learn you a free book, unless your question is terrible. But thank you very much. Uh, and you could just ask us. We don't have a microphone, but I'll repeat your question. Right there. What do you think about uh, nutrition studies, especially uh, primary ones, early ones, being used in advertising? Oh, the question is, what do I think about nutrition studies being used in advertising? And you know, again, my expertise is very, very far from medicine. I would be very cautious about it, right? Because nutrition studies, all you need if you are the company is one study that shows some connection between your product and some outcome that you like. And that could easily be the coin flipping, right? You're not worried about whether it's been corroborated by anything else. Uh, so I would be cautious in general about longitudinal studies that find any association between diet and outcome that hasn't been repeated. But then when you add a commercial interest, which gets back to my whole point of view thing, that I would be very, very cautious about that. Right back there and then we'll come up here. Uh, when you talk about causality, are you talking about uh, general causality or the bracket approach on the legal criteria? That well, I, I don't know anything about the legal criteria. In the social science element, we're just thinking about whether A brings about change B. And in particular, if we think it does, then if we change A, we can expect the same change in outcome for other folks, right? So uh, a good one would be drug use among adolescents and dropping out of high school. Do we think that's causal, or do we think the kids are kind of messed up, use more drugs? That's a really important thing to know, but teasing out the causality is very, very hard. But if we knew that drug use actually really did have a causal relationship with dropping out, then that would that would justify spending a lot of resources in a way that would reduce dropouts. What we think about it as kind of one, imp one factor bringing about another one, particularly things that we might be able to change the behavior. And right here. So one of, the, one of the problems that everybody in this room has and every physician uh, has but doesn't talk about is the challenge of translating uh, randomized controlled trial data, which gives you a mean answer and some confidence intervals on the mean answer, to the care or the decision of an individual who's gone to try to make. Right. So the question is, you've got randomized clinical trials that give you some mean outcome for some group of people who happen to be in the trial, and any physician's got to then make a decision about a specific patient. Um, I think probably more caution is due than we know. For First of all, we know that the randomized clinical trials are not broadly representative of the population. So they, for example, they're less likely to include people who are quite elderly. They're less likely to include minorities. I think women may also be underrepresented. So if, you know, as medicine shifts more heavily towards geriatric care and you're making decisions based on 57-year-olds, that's kind of a problem. Now, what I don't know is what the recipe is. I guess uh, probably better clinical trials, more effort to kind of get participants who are more broadly representative and to recognize the limitations. So yes, randomized clinical trials are the gold standard, standard of research, but it has the same limitations everything I've talked about, which is if your sample's not good, 
or your sample's not representative, then it still has limitations. How you do that as a physician, I don't know. I mean, it's way beyond my purview. Um, but I, I do know that more data will be better, and this may be one area where if we can then tease out relationships that are more specific to different demographics, it might help you a little. But at the end of the day, the judgment is not going to go away. Um, I wish I had a better answer for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the percent, there's a, literally like half a chapter on fun with percentages because they're probably the most easily exploitable of all the descriptive statistics. So you're absolutely right. The problem is when you have a small base, a percentage change is just reflective of whatever base you start with. I had a friend who solicited, a different friend from the hotwire guy who solicited a lot of money from me for this new company. It wasn't public, so it was very little information. After about four years of hearing nothing, he sent a note saying, great news, our profits are up 25% from last year. But there were no absolute numbers, right? So it literally could have gone from like 13 cents to 15 cents. Um, and, and so, yeah, from a low, so uh, in Chicago, we had a newspaper headline that literally said property taxes for the tuberculosis sanitarium district to go up by 500%. I'm like, oh my God. And they were going from $1 to $5. I mean, they, we don't have a lot of tuberculosis. Why we even have a sanitarium, I don't know, but, right? Um, or another one, which is in Chicago uh, or in Illinois, they raised the personal income tax from 3% to 5% the rate. And the Democrats who were in charge said, well, it's a two percentage point increase, which it is, from 3% to 5%. And the Republicans said, well, it's a 67% increase in the tax, in your income tax, which is also true. Right? So they weren't even using the same numbers to describe the same phenomenon, and they were both right. But your point, particularly as it relates to rare cancers, when you've got numbers that are three in 100,000, then even a modest change, which is probably going to be a function of chance, is going to look like a huge increase or decrease. And that is in just one inherent limitation of using percentage change as a descriptive statistic. Uh, all right, why don't we take one more and then we'll sign some books. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. It's hard even when the folks doing the research are intellectually honest, right? Because they have to simplify. It gets much harder when they have a point of view, right? And that and that's when I think you read, you know, again, I don't want to delve too far beyond my expertise, but the, you know, the data on industry sponsored clinical trial, I mean, there's some bad stuff lurking there in terms of the proportion of things that can be replicated and so on. And that marries just the inherent uncertainty of research to the fact that they actually work for the defense or the prosecution. And I think that caution is well warranted uh, in this field and every other one. Uh, all right, we'll stop there. Thank you very much for coming. It was fun to share the time with you. And our, our coin flippers and our question answerers can come up and get some free books, which I'd be happy to sign. And there may be a few extras after that.